I'll give the mic to Heidi. Hello, wake up. Did you find more coffee? Excellent. All right, I'm going to do the devil's DevOps, which is an exploration of DevOps terms because I feel like we have a lot of internal knowledge that we haven't shared adequately with people who are new to the space. So I decided to write a glossary in the spirit of Ambrose Bierce's Devil's Dictionary. Infrastructure is the teetering edifice that we labor to simultaneously uphold and reform, sort of like changing the tires on a moving car. Continuous integration is the exciting state of never being sure you didn't just break something. Because if you're always deploying and integrating, you're always at risk for having broken something, right? Yay, continuous integration. The cloud has several definitions. The first is other people's servers. The second is an abstraction layer for spending money that you couldn't get hardware budget for. And the third is the vaporous form of pixie dust. Like, we're going to send it to the cloud. Deployment is when code escapes into public view, leaving a wreckage behind it. Or sometimes it's the thing that just took down your production environment. Testing in production is a variant pronunciation of YOLO, which is you only live once. It is also an excellent way to find errors at scale. In case you were worried that you didn't have enough errors, we can now make them bigger. Mean time to recovery is how much a client yells at you while you're trying to get the system back up because they're super angry. So like, how long did you get yelled at? That's your mean time to recovery. Agile is a design perspective centered on moving fast and dodging any kind of definition or deadline. Just in case anybody tries to nail you down on when something will be done, say, can't do that, we're doing Agile. Automation is the process of making things fail consistently and predictably with no human oversight. Because God knows we don't want to have to fail things all the time ourselves, our little fingers get tired. A microservice is a small, independent operation that multiplies the complexity of your testing combinatorically. Every time you add a microservice, you've also added a whole new testing suite of nightmares. Technical debt, the development version of student loans, perennial, hard to discharge, and how you got here in the first place, right? Maybe just me? Container, a box to put inside another box, running on a box that you can then use to ship boxes, at which point you just start going, docker, 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 docker. Silo, a security device to prevent the accidental transmission of knowledge from one part of your organization to another. Very effective. Nines. Nines are a unit of failure. The more you have, the harder they are to maintain. So if you have a lot of nines, you spend all your time worrying about your nines because nines are very fragile. Observability. Observability is the ability to tell what has gone wrong if, with really high cardinality, which means you can tell exactly what went wrong. Super exciting. Maybe? Shift left. It is a key that is next to the Z or Z, if you're in Canada, on the QWERTY keyboard. So if someone tells you to shift left, make sure you're using your left pinky and not your right pinky. A-B testing is a way to show a new bug to only half your customers at a time, because that way you can get some like comparative analysis on how they feel about the new bug versus the old bug. Chaos engineering is the practice of introducing poo-flinging monkeys into your production environment on purpose because your life was not exciting enough. Event-driven architecture. That's when you've designed a system around messages being sent and received. Probably. Nothing could go wrong with this plan. 
So that's what I've got for you. I hope these kind definitions have helped you understand what it is that you're doing in the DevOps world. Thanks. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Raja. Uh, I've been working with innovation for the past seven years. Let me ask you this question before I begin. How many of you think you're innovative? Quite a few. I like the laugh. Well, I like the quote about Mark Twain and my entire journey with, uh, can be summed up with Mark Twain's quote. The quote goes like this. It's not that you do not know that kills you. It's what you know for sure that isn't true. I like the quote because the second phrase of it is where I thought I knew something, but that wasn't true. So this was my team. We had these three rules. And the objective was the team was to prepare or more, generate more ideas to have innovative projects running around the organization. And we followed a standard process. You brainstorm, you ideate, you integrate, you iterate, and you deploy it. It was a very standard approach. And I want to focus on the first two steps, the brainstorming and the ideation steps. We started off really good. But then, over a period of time, which is three months, we, were able to gen we weren't able to generate enough ideas. And we were trying to struggle with this sort of small team who identified themselves as innovative, who identified themselves as creative. And we couldn't able to generate more ideas. And we were really lagging in our innovative index across the organization. And that's where I learned that if you want to have more and more ideas, then you should have even better people running or preparing the ideas. And we follow other different approaches. These are the different approaches we followed. And I'm sure most of the organizations follow these approaches. But all of them failed because we are running with the same people who are already identifying themselves as creative, whereas we are ignoring the rest of the population who's think, who are creative but who do not believe that they are creative. And I like this quote about Linus Pauling, which says, if you want to have a good idea, then you should have a lot of ideas. The problem is we are focusing on 10 persons who are already identifying as innovative and leaving the rest of 90 people. I've learned these two myths. The first myth I've learned about innovation is innovation is a talent, which is completely wrong. Innovation is a skill. It's not that only certain people are gifted with it. We can learn. We can, it can be taught. It can be, uh, it can be preached. The second myth I've learned is about innovation versus creativity. Whenever we talk about innovation, we kind of relate it to an artistic skill. Oh, I'm not creative. I'm not the artistic type. I'm not the musician type, which isn't, again, wrong. When you talk about these things, you leave the rest of the population, which is 90% of them, who think they're not artistic, who think they're not creative. So those are the two myths I've learned. Well, what are the steps to generate more ideas? The first step is to build that creative confidence. We all, as kids, have been creative. But down the line, as we grow up, someone will have told us, that's a bad idea. That's the worst idea I've ever heard of. You have to educate the rest of the population who have left out that they are all also creative. That's the first step in kind of educating them about the creative confidence, giving them the confidence that they are creative. The second step is breaking the barrier. Oh, sorry. The second step is about building that creative confidence, be it as simply as having a chalkboard on your, dry, on your walkway on the aisle or having the collaborative workspace. Kind of once you see that the creative confidence is budding up, help them build that creative confidence. And the third is almost a result of these first and second step, where you break that barrier, where you see the rest of 90% of crowd who have been left out in this innovation drama joining you. I want to tell you this personal story. When I was growing up, I had this neighbor kid. Um, her name was Deepthi. She was four years old. Um, we were playing, and she was eating chips. And I was fond of chips. So I asked her, can you give me a chips? She gave me one chip. I said, I'm a big guy. Give me at least two. She took the chip back, broke it into two, and gave it back to me. <laughs> See, kids are very creative. Kids are so, they're not afraid of social rejections. We where when we were kids, we weren't afraid of being creative. We weren't afraid of failures. How many of you see a woman in this picture? How many of you see a man in this picture? How many of you see both of them? Is there anybody in this room who do not see either of them? That's my point. Everybody sees things differently. 
Everybody is creative. Everybody has their own perspective. We have to capture, we have to utilize, we have to leverage the population which has been ignored all along in this innovation drama. That's where the problem with the hackathons. We invite people who are already identifying themselves as creative, but then we need to engage all the people who have been left out. And that's my quote I want to sum up with. Every artist, every child is an artist. The problem is to remain an artist as you grow up. Thank you. Very smooth, Raja. Well done. All right. Sure. All right. Here it goes. Hi, I'm Odie. I work for Optum. I'm going to talk about operations. So this segment is brought to you by the letter O. <laughs> Coming next, I want to see a show of hands of who loves themselves some operations. There's got to be somebody. All right. Those who aren't holding their hands up, look at you with lots of love and think you are one twisted individual. So who does your operations? You probably know. I'm not going to make any generalizations about the kind of people that are doing operations, what your teams are like. But if you don't know your operations team, go find them, go meet them, talk to them, find out what their day is like. So there's a lot out there. I'm not going to spend time what their day is like. But this is where your great ideas meet reality. It should be fine, right? So I've been seeing a trend that I think is what we really need to talk about. And I've been seeing that we somehow think we get beyond operations. We think we are somehow above doing operations. And I think that's coming with some pretty good consequences to our industry. So it's time for us to think about this. Some of the reasons that feed into that, we uh, heard it from Paul this morning. We like to talk about the failure. We think about our failures. Nobody wants to hear about operations except how fast they fixed that incident. Operations is still after hours. As much as we talk about all these great ideas on how to make all these deploys per day and how to make all this happen in, in real time, we are still making people work in the middle of the night and on weekends for upgrades and changes. Whatever your family may be like, I can tell you right now, they don't like it when you're getting pulled into endless things on weekends. When you have all of these extra unhappy events, it makes for unhappy family events. So a quick sidetrack on my personal experience. Uh, five years ago, I joined a health exchange in the 11th hour, thinking that we could do great things. On paper, it met its goals. It did what it was supposed to do, but at some very great cost. The aftermath for me was that I have certain ringtones I can never hear again. <laughs> there are individuals who, when I hear their voice five years later, I instantly go into a panic. So it has a very lasting appeal. Why was this so bad? Well, I can tell you there was no predictability. Everything happened after hours, and there was no predictability, so that meant we were all involved all the time. There was no continuous improvement. So some of the real outcomes of this is I feel that we are undermining our potential to actually mature our operations and, and make for healthy operations in our organizations. We have all kinds of great theories. We heard a lot this morning about failure and learning from failure, but when we are running from operations, we are not feeding that back in. The systemic learning is not happening in so many of our organizations. So my challenge to us today, and what I hope we can take, is that it's time for us to start loving ops. It's time for us to all get involved and all take a little bit apart to see what, how we can uh, engage to make this improve. So some of the puppies, some of the things in this idea. You're going to be a lot more proud of something when you are involved and are accountable for how it works. Standing back and watching the dumpster fire is not going to make it happy for you. Discipline, resiliency, predictability, all these things that make good operations are things that learned. I think they are learned with context. You might learn great things out here in theory, but in your company, there is so much to be learned about your product and how it works. I can't go without a slide that's got a, a charity quote and talk about operations. This is a great way to be customer centric. This is where your ideas and your products meet customers. This is a great place to make improvement for that. 
We could go on and on about suggestions. There are tons out there. You've even heard some already today. But I think the most important is talk to people in your company. Get the ideas that will work for your culture and make it an active participation for everyone. This is important for anybody who's in development and in security and in HR and in finance. For us to talk about what we could do sustainably to make operations better is gonna make operations better. So I wanna end with an I will statement. Each and every one of you needs to right now think about a statement. I will do blank next week to improve operations in my company. So please think that through and talk to you soon. So I believe as DevOps practitioners, we have a lot to learn from wildland firefighters. I'll share how I got drawn into their work and touch on a few of the key people and concepts. In 2014, John Allspa gave a talk, and he talked about the facilitated learning analysis developed by Ivan Papuliti at the Office of Learning in the US Forest Service. He talked about the Saddleback Fire accident investigation as an example we can learn from, and this immediately resonated with me because of a family connection to wildland firefighters. My father-in-law, Larry Young, worked as a range manager for the Bureau of Land Management in Idaho, but in fire season, he fought wildland fires from Southern California to Alaska and across the Intermountain West. A theme emerged in many of his uh, stories about wildland firefighting. Every fire was unique. Wildland fires are complex and they require constant adaptation. Let's look at a few of them. Organizational adaptations are required. Here's Larry and his colleagues at the startup of the Boise Interagency Fire Center, which was established to coordinate the work of eight separate federal agencies involved in wildland firefighting. There are uh, Adaptations that are simple, like these tools, the Pulaski and the McLeod, named for the firefighters who invented them, or complicated, like smoke jumper gear or single engine air tankers. The firefighter's gear is a mixture of high tech and low tech, but more than tools and individuals are required, socio technical adaptations are required. Every member of the multiple crews here itself is a complex in, in, adaptive system, and their offsite uh, weather and logistics and other teams that all together are an example of what David Woods has called the complex adaptive universe. In an excellent pre-accident podcast interview, Dave Christensen talked about how after a tragic fire, uh, study resulted in two key recommendations. The first was to create a single lessons learned center for the entire wildland fire community. And the second was creating this wildland fire, fire leadership development program, which had a mission to help promote the uh, change of culture in the wildland firefighting community. And leaders started going to graduate studies to advance that mission. Krista Vessel did a uh, master's program at Lund University on how language could bias accident investigations. Ivan Papuliti's doctoral thesis described how transforming some key practices moved them and their organization from a culture of blame to a culture of learning. Joe Harris investigated how the military practice of staff rides could be adapted uh, to their needs and he created new learning products that enabled the impact of a staff ride but to reach a much larger audience. These two images linked to video versions of staff rides, a long one for use in a case study and a shorter one that's on the TED-Ed platform. Learning culture scaled up to the Forest Service's most robust process, the learning review, but also down to rapid lesson sharing's process, which can be quickly done by an individual. Margin of maneuver is a method for assessing 
whether options and adaptive capacity is increasing or decreasing. It's been incorporated in learning reviews and it's taught to individual firefighters to help them make tactical decisions. Sarah Brown's webinar is an example of how firefighters' transformation to a learning culture helps them to tackle difficult and uncomfortable issues that still remain in their culture. If you're interested in the deep dive, I put lots of references here. A good starting place is Ivan and Krista's most recent paper down at the bottom of the references. If any of this sounds of interest, we can uh, pick that up in other conversations later in the conference or in open spaces. So I'd like to thank the Wildwind firefighting community for openly sharing their knowledge with us. And thanks to all of you. Good job, Adam. Hey everyone, last but not least. Uh, my name is Matt Westgate. Uh, thanks for being here. This is my first time speaking and attending uh, at uh, DevOps Days, and, and I feel welcome, so thank you for that. I'm going to talk about psychological safety and DevOps. Uh, I'm really interested in how DevOps gets sparked within an organization, uh, and I believe that uh, in order for a DevOps culture and practice to thrive, you need to have two things. You need to have safety and collaboration. And there's lots of research on both of those things, but we're only going to dive into the safety side uh, today. So an example of not feeling safe is being that person that's in the middle of a, of a, of a meeting and you want to raise your hand and sort of call BS on something, but nobody else, does, nobody else does, so you feel like maybe you're supposed to know the answer. That's what it's like to not feel uh, safe, safe enough to speak up. If there's one thing to take home is to bring this back to your organization, that you will not be punished or humiliated for speaking up with ideas, questions, concerns, or mistakes. It has some really powerful, empowering outcomes for, for a group. Um, an example uh, of that is I was working on a large database migration project, and during the migration process, we had an off by one error on the user ID profile. So when their company lawyer called my company and said, you know, when I logged into the site, it said I was a 14-year-old girl. I knew that there was some big problems. Uh, the person on my team uh, that did the database migration was quick to own it. She said it was me. I did this. I'm also the most capable to remediate this. Let me solve this problem. And she did. And we laugh about it today. After, uh, after that whole incident happened, I said, you know, you are our new database migration expert. And she said, what do you mean? I said, if there's anybody uh, that I trust to, to, to do migrations right, it's, it's you now. Um, and I think that story would have ended very differently had that safety not been in place uh, for her to have that outcome. So I guess the point of it is that failure is not always the opportunity. I think the safety and creating a, um, a safe uh, emotional workplace is really where the opportunity is. Otherwise, you're just having mistakes that nobody knows about and nobody talks about. There's some really interesting research on how effective psychological safety is. Um, the folks at Google a couple of years ago put this report together. The, the baseline is that the most important thing is psychological safety, and then everything else comes after that. Uh, the problem is that every time that we don't speak up, we rob ourselves and our team of small moments of learning and possible innovation that can happen. We all have learned that from just sitting here today. Uh, there are three steps to build psychological safety within a team. This is done by the research of Amy Edmondson, who's a, who's a Harvard professor. You're probably already familiar with some of her work. The first step is to frame the work as a learning problem and not an execution problem. And what that means is to say, hey, listen, this is a big thorny issue. I need everybody, I need their voices and brains all highly engaged in this. That creates the rationale for speaking up. Step two is to say, listen, I'm not going to get everything. So much is flying by that if you see something, speak up. Um, and that creates, that creates the safety uh, for raising, raising your voice. Uh, and the third one is to model curiosity, to, to, to be an exemplar of the behavior that you're trying to advocate for. If other people see you asking questions, they'll be empowered to ask questions as well. So for better or worse, this kind of change usually comes from leadership. Leadership drives culture. It's what they want to do and how they want to do it. Sometimes you need to replace leadership 
to get, the, to get a, a psychologically safe uh, work environment. Sometimes it can come from the, from the bottom as well. But leadership aside, it's not about who's on the team. It's not, if you, not that you do consensus-driven de, uh, decision-making. It's not about a group full of introvert, extroverts. It's how well everybody works together uh, is the key factor. Um, once you start to have that in place, uh, don't start doing a bunch of top-down orders on what needs to be fixed. Your team is out there on the front line. They know where the problems are and use that to figure out how to automate together. Some of my favorite uh, tools for collaboration are version control, code reviews, and preview environments. They may be very basic DevOps tools, but they also, I think, uh, put a focus on safety and collaboration. Or, as one engineer said when they reviewed my slide, they say, listen, I can sum it up for you. When a team has empathy, trust, and openness, DevOps tends to follow. And they said, pizza isn't bad either. Thank you so much. <laughs>